We're talking about the spiritual journey that we all have. So as a church, as we were discussing what the spiritual journey of a Christian, of a believer, what that looks like, we thought that it would be a good idea to wrap it up in four words. You're gonna put the words up on the screens. And this is what we believe are the next steps in someone's spiritual journey. The first one we spoke about last week and we talked about reach, meaning that we believe that we should reach out to a God who's already reached out to us. And the second part of the spiritual journey is help. In fact, this is what we're gonna be covering today. We believe that we have a God who wants to help us and the way that he helps us is through community. I really believe that one of the most important roles that we have as a church is to make sure that everybody gets plugged into a life-giving community because life really changes when you're connected to the right people and have the right people around you. The third one, which is gonna happen next week, I really, really hope that you show up. It's gonna be an amazing, amazing message because we believe that we have a God who wants to teach us the purpose that we have in this life. And, and we believe as a church, it's our responsibility to teach people and help people understand what's the purpose that God has for you. Last but not least, we're gonna be talking about release. After we discover our purpose, we believe that God wants to release us to make a difference in this world. Come on, is anybody thankful that we have a God who wants to use us to make a difference in the world. It's amazing. Like I said today, uh, we're gonna be discovering the second part, help, and we're gonna talk about how we believe that God really wants to help us through community. And I just wanna say this, I really believe that this is probably one of the most important topics that we will discuss as a church. Uh, for example, if I were to ask you, what were the names of the last five sermons that you've heard? Chances are you wouldn't be able to name them. Well, if I were to ask you, hey, what are the names, five names of people who have directly impacted your life? Right now, you're probably thinking about names who have, who have played a significant role in your life. And that's why we believe that community is important. If you have your notebooks, take them out. If you're not taking notes, please take notes. I believe that they check notes in heaven. This is how we get in. The name of this message this morning is called A Group Project. A Group Project. Hey, can we give a big round of applause to our band? You guys are awesome. Love you guys so much. Amazing. We're blessed. We're blessed. We have an amazing worship team. But let's bow our heads, close our eyes. I believe the Holy Spirit's going to do something special this morning. So, Father, we thank you so much for your grace, your love, and your mercy. Holy Spirit, we thank you because we believe that you are doing something amazing. Father, we know that everyone here has a different story, that life has looked different for everyone. So, Father, I ask that you would take this word break it in the million pieces and it would land in the hearts of people who need to hear it. So Father, I ask that you would give us eyes to see you, ears to hear you, and a heart to receive you. Father, that we would see what you want us to see. Everyone here, we, we all have a next step, God, and you've, you've planned that next step out for us. So Father, I ask that you would guide us in that step. And it's in Jesus' name. All of God's people said? Amen. Come on, all of God's people said? Come on, if you love Jesus, give him one big round of applause this morning. Amazing. All right. School. Um, uh, I'm going to be very careful uh, about how I say this because I know that we have students in the audience today, uh, this morning. But my favorite part about school was when it was over. <laughs> like, my, honestly, my favorite subjects were always like art, gym, and lunch, like, like this is just, it's just what I did, you know, it's what I enjoyed, it's what I thought I was just good at, and what I told my mom, the excuse that I told my mom is, mom, is that school right now is just not conducive to my learning style, you know, like, I'm a talker, I need to talk things through, come on, how many of you guys know that excuse did not work for mom, come on, I, I was still grounded, grades weren't good, you're grounded, so because talking, I believe, is like my, my learning style, as you can imagine, my favorite type of assignments were group projects. Now, there's people laughing in here, you don't like group projects, and that's indicative of your personality. In fact, the reason that you don't like group projects is usually because of people like me. So, so let me explain this to you. Like, the reason I love group projects, I really believe that group projects is a microcosm, it's an illustration, it's almost a picture as to how I believe society actually works today. It works, it's, I think it's this way in your job environment, in your schooling, I think group projects, perfect picture of society today. What do I mean? Uh, inside of every group, I believe that there's three different categories of people, okay? You have the doers, you have the helpers, Lord Jesus, 
You have the doers, you have the helpers, and you have the talkers. Now, the doers, these are, these are the straight A, any straight A students in the audience? Okay, not a lot, that's good. We don't like the straight, the, the, the straight A students, like, these are, these are the mean students. These are, these are the ones who will step over people to get the assignment done. They don't care about anyone except themselves. They don't, ch I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But th these are the people that, you know what, no matter what, they're just, they're just going to get the assignment done. Now, the next group of people, there are the helpers. Now, I think the helpers are the most amazing people on the planet. If you're a helper, thank you so much for existing. You make our world, our universe better. Helpers are always available. They're always present. They're always willing to do whatever to get the project done. Helpers usually don't do the talking. Unfortunately, they should do most of the talking because they're usually the nicest ones. I love helpers. Thank you so much for your existence. You guys are awesome. Now, then there's the talkers. Now, what you have to understand about the talkers is that we're a creative bunch. Um, usually, usually the talkers, uh, they usually don't have the best work ethic. Like, for example, if you get a group of doers, the assignment's going to get done. If you get a group of helpers, come on, how many of you know, the assignment is going to get done. But if you get a group of talkers, they will go nowhere, but where they are is awesome. I, I, I think the talkers are, I think the talkers were, were awesome. Now, 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 the reason that I bring up this illustration is because I really believe that life is a group project. Now, I, I feel like I said that, and there were some people in the audience that they were like, oh, no, it's not. These are the doers. The talkers are like, yes, yes, it is. Let's do this together. It's going to be awesome. Now, now he, he, here's the thing. I, I really believe that life is a group project. What I'm trying to say is this, is that I really believe that you and I are relational beings. That God has designed us and created us for community. That God has designed us and created us for friendship. I really believe that you and I are called to live interconnected. And in fact, I really believe, believe that I can prove this to you even biblically. In Genesis chapter 1, the first book of the Bible, God says something really amazing. This is probably one of the most confusing, but probably one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. We're going to put it up on the screens. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. Now, now this verse is a confusing one because really what this is, this is God, in a sense, talking to himself. And God says, let us create man in our image. Wait, God, what do you mean? What do, what do you mean us and what do you mean our? You see, what we have to understand about God is that we believe in one God who presents himself in three different persons. We believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Mike, I need you to theologically break down how this works. I can't. This is what makes God God and us not. Like, this is what makes him a mystery. This is what makes him God, that we have to search the beautiful riches of his nature and his personality. One God who makes up three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that God within himself is a community. Now, what this verse is saying is that you and I were made in the image and likeness of this God which means that you and I were created to be community beings, that you and I were created to live in community. I really think that this is a central theme throughout the Bible. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, the same exact book, we see something crazy happen because God is now creating the very first man. His name is Adam. The story goes that God, he, he's playing with some dust. He picks up the dust and he creates, and he creates a human being. But look at what God says about Adam after he creates it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. He says, it is not good for man to be alone. So I will make a helper suitable to help him. All right. This is what we have to understand. What we have to understand is this, is that sin was not the first problem in the Bible. It was not. The first problem in the Bible was solitude. It was being isolated, and it was being alone. 
I mean, you got to think about the story for a second because you got Adam, right? Adam's walking with God. He's having community with God. You would think that Adam had it all. But God looked at the situation. God looked at the circumstance, and he said, hey, it's not good for you to walk alone. There's a plan. There's a purpose. There's an assignment that I have for your life. And the only way that you're going to be able to fulfill this assignment is for you to get in community because in community you will be able to live out the plan and the purpose that I have for your life. The reality is, is that we can't do life alone. I mean, this is a crazy concept. Follow with me on this same story of Adam because God looks at Adam. You know the Bible, Genesis, he says he creates this apple, he creates this tree, and he tells Adam, hey, look, you can have whatever you want, but you can't eat from the fruit of this tree. You, you, you can't touch it. There's a command, there's a destiny, there's an assignment that God gave Adam. And after God gave Adam this assignment, he goes, wait a second. In order for this person to live out the life I've called him to live, and to follow my commandments, what do I need to do? I need to create community to be with him and to do this with him. I, I really believe that this is an important topic. The reason that I believe that this is an important topic is because I really feel that there's people here today that we're living in solitude and isolated. That, that, that we're alone and that we are, that we're isolated. Well, hold on, Mike, what do you mean, bro? Like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm in a crowd right now. Like, life is good. What you, I'm around people. Yeah, you can be in a crowd, but you can still be lonely. I feel like we live in the most connected but most disconnected generation that this world has ever seen. Where you got people all around you, but you're still by yourself. In fact, because some of us, we have no one in our circle, because we have no one in our community, there's things that we're living out in our life, there's challenges that we're facing that we're not able to overcome because we don't have people in our circle helping us to get through it. Like, can I say it like this? I really don't think that this is a heaven or hell issue. Like, there's a lot of people in here, like, yeah, you know. Like, you gave your life to Jesus, like, you know you're going to go to heaven. Like, this is not a heaven or hell issue. This is a quality of life issue. And some of us, the, the quality of life that we're living is not the life that we were intended to live. Why? Simply because we're doing life alone and we're doing life isolated. Like if there's one thing that I can tell you today, like what I would want you to write down, I hope you're taking notes, is this, is that true freedom will always be found in true community. True freedom will always be found in true community. Can, can I tell you, this is why Jesus came down to earth. This is the whole point of the gospel. I mean, think about this for a second. The nickname that, that the Bible gives Jesus was the friend of sinners. Like his nickname is a relational name. Not only that, but the Bible says that Jesus came down to earth and he died on the cross. Why did he die on the cross? Simple, so that he can restore our relationship with him and so that he can restore our relationship with others. Jesus came to restore all things. I really believe, listen, that community is the central theme throughout the Bible. So if it's a central biblical theme, it should be a central theme in our lives personally. But I, I think what happens is, is that a lot of us, we just use excuses. Right? And, and I think a lot of the excuses that we use are, are excuses, honestly, that we can just, that we can debunk, that we can say, hey, this excuse really doesn't carry any weight. I, I'll give you the first, the first excuse that I usually hear is this, is Mike, it's just, I, I don't think that I need it. Like I, really, like I really believe that this life, I can do it alone. You know, I heard this story once of Muhammad Ali. The story goes that Muhammad Ali, famous boxer, he gets on this plane, and there's a flight attendant. She's a small, little old woman. She goes to Muhammad Ali, and she goes, Sir, you need to buckle up. The airplane's about to take off. So Muhammad Ali looks at her, and he says, Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. So this woman, the flight attendant, little old lady, looks back at Muhammad Ali and says, Superman doesn't need an airplane either. Put on your seatbelt. <laughs> and, and, and I really think that, that this is the life that, that we're living, that we're living a life that we think that we can just, we can just do it on our own. Right. Well, what about this one, temperament? People say, Mike, I, I can't, I don't want to go to community. I don't want to get in connect group. It's just, not, it's just not my personality. It's not who I am. It's awkward. And the issue with this is that who you are is what's keeping you from living the life that God has created you to be. And, and we're using our temperament as an excuse not to get into community that will, that will bless our life. I think another one is fear. People always use fear. Like, like Mike, what's going to happen if I get plugged into a connect group? Like, what's going to happen if I choose to do life with people? 
I think people have this idea that if they go to a connect group, they're going to open a door to a house, and it's going to be like a circle of chairs, and in the middle, there's going to be one chair for you for when you get there. <laughs> but the reality is, is that I think that some of the fears that we have are, are, are genuine fears. Like, the reality is, is that some of us, were dealing with some really personal stuff, and, and to tell people our personal information, it takes a level of trust. And we're just afraid that our trust is going to be, is going to be abused. I heard this, this uh, story of a connect group. It was actually a men's group. It was three men who have been meeting in a group for almost about a year. And what God was doing in this particular group, well, it was powerful. Uh, there, was, there was a man in the group, and, and he was feeling very, very convicted. And he was like, guys, you know what? I, I just feel like I need to reveal this to you. Um, I've been dealing with a heavy addiction, a heavy pornography addiction. It's been ruining my, my marriage. It's been ruining my family dynamic. And there's another guy in the group, and he goes, hey, you know what? I'm really happy that you, that you brought this up because uh, I, I'm dealing with a bad gambling addiction. Like, my family is in debt. The money that I was supposed to use to pay off my daughter's college tuition, I, I used it on my gambling. Then the third guy, he goes, whoa, guys, I'm really, I'm really happy that you guys said this because I have, I have a gossip problem, and I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> And I really think that, that that's the guy that we're afraid of as to why we don't get in groups. But I, I really think this next excuse, um, I really think this next excuse, it's an epidemic, really. I feel like this next excuse is, is ruining the course of our life, if we're honest. And some of us say, Mike, I'm just too busy. Like, life is just too busy. I got too much on my plate, you know? And what happens is that we have let the world set an agenda for our life. And whatever the world wants us to do, we say, okay, and we'll do it. And the reality is that the agenda that society has placed on us is keeping us from the things that really matter. It's keeping us from the things that really matter, like our marriages. And it's keeping us from the things that really matter, like our friendships and our churches and our community and connect groups. And it's, it's keeping us from things that really matter. Some of us, we just don't want to go get plugged into community because of past experiences. Because some of us have been hurt so badly by someone that we trust. That we put our heart on the line and they've abused it and they've taken our information, they've shared it with other people. Some people have stabbed us in the back and, and walked away from us and marriages have been destroyed because of this reason and relationships have been destroyed because of this reason. But I wanna let you know that that incident was not random. That was not a random incident. I believe that was an incident that was designed by the enemy to keep you from the very thing that's going to bless your life, and that's getting plugged into a community of people who love you and who care about you. Last reason, people say, I don't want to go to group. I don't want to get plugged into community. Mike, this, this church is just too big. Like, it's too big for people to actually know who I am. Can I tell you, a church of 100 is still too big. A church of 100 people is still too big. That's why you need to get in something smaller. You need to get involved in a community of people, a connect group of people who love you and are willing to do this life with you. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, one church. Each member needs all the other members. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you need me. You need me. Look at your second option and say, you need me. You need me. I just helped somebody get a date this afternoon. <laughs> I heard somebody say, you need me and you want me. I heard somebody say that. <laughs> All right. So there was this, uh, there's this personality test. It's a personality profile test. And it was designed in the 1940s, but this personality test was so effective that people still use it today. They use it in workplace. In fact, we use it in growth track. And the name of this personality test is called DISC. And the creator of this DISC personality test said that there's basically four categories that make up everybody's personality. The four categories are, if you're taking notes, I hope you can write this down. The four categories are this, arena, mask, blind spot, and potential. These are the four categories that makes up everybody's personality according to the person who designed this test. Arena, mask, blind spot, and potential. Now, this same exact person said that usually in a person's lifetime, 
that only one of these issues gets resolved. That the other three issues usually don't get resolved, but today, I wanna make the case how getting plugged into community and getting plugged into a connect group will touch each part of your personality and heal it. And I really feel that getting plugged into a community of people who love us and are for us will help us find freedom in certain areas. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define these areas and then we're gonna talk about how, com how connect groups affect these areas. The first area that I wanna talk about is arena. Arena, this is the, the first area of our personality. This is, this is, this is the part that, that I know and you know. Like this is the public me. This is the me that I want everybody to see. For example, like there's people here that you're here for the first time and just based on seeing me, you have already formulated an opinion based on what I'm showing you publicly. But the reality is this, is that there's things on the inside of me that you really don't know. So, so the arena is the person that we often pretend to be. It's the person that we highlight, the person that we put on Instagram, the person that we put on social media. It's the person that we often pretend to be that when we walk in in church, hey, bro, how you doing? Brother, I'm doing so good, blessed and highly favored, anointed and appointed, too blessed to be stressed. Like, like we throw out all these Christian cliches, but really outside of church we're suffering and, and there's issues that are really, that are really happening. If you find yourself in this place, like often I find myself in this place, the reality is this, is that I need people who really know me. Like you need to have people in your life that really, can I ask you a question? Who really knows you? Because there's stuff on the inside of you that nobody else knows about except you. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 says, For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? Meaning that there's things on the inside of you that you really, that you really don't know about. I, I think that my job as a pastor, my, I think my, my main job, honestly, is to help people get plugged into a community of people where they're doing life together. Where, where, people, where people know who you are. That's why the approach of these messages that we're going to be preaching is going to be so much different. It's going to be very teachable. It's going to be very like, hey, this is, this, is your next, this is your next step. We want to make it obvious. Because I really believe that the desire that God has for your life is for you to get plugged into a group. For you to get plugged into a community of people who, who really love you and want to do life with you. I heard this story of another men's group. And there was this guy in the men's group who got diagnosed with cancer. It looked like it was going to be terminal. It looks like, honestly, like he was going to pass away. And what the Connect Group did was amazing. Really, all the men, they got together and they shaved their heads. Basically, it's, it's if, if you suffer, I, I suffer. And I feel like that's what we need in our corner. You know, there was a woman here, most of you guys know her. She was a Dream Team member. Her name was Mercy. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, she passed away and she's, she's with the Lord now. And it, it was on a Sunday morning, you know. Uh, I, I'm getting to church like at 6.45 in the morning, and I'm thinking of all the logistics that we have to put in order to make church happen. I'm thinking, like, are the Dream Team members here? Are all the servants here? We're going to make this happen. This is going to be awesome. And as I'm pulling up to the church, <laughs> I see people who, who, who work to make church happen on a Sunday leave, and they're, and they're driving away. Then all of a sudden, I run into another Dream Team member. He's one of the host team leads. His name is Mike Delgado. He's a legend. And, and I was talking to him. I was like, hey, bro, where's everyone going? And basically, he said, hey, look, uh, Mercy passed away this morning. We're all leaving because we're going to go to the hospital. We're going to pray for her and the family, believe that God is going to do something amazing in that hospital room. And then I thought to myself, whoa, that's the church. Yeah. I, thought, I thought to myself, that, that's the church leaving the church to be the church. And for me, I feel like I had a, I had a perspective shift in my mind where I was like, okay, th this, this is what it's about. It's about people doing life together, having people in our corner who really love us and care about us. Here's the second part. The second part is, is mask, mask. Everyone here, we all have a mask. This is a person that I know, but you don't know. It's not like the arena, it's a little different because this isn't the person that I project to be. In fact, this is the person that I hide. Like everyone in here has a mask, meaning that there's things on the inside of you that, that no one knows. And I want to let you know that this is a very scary place to be because you will always be as sick as your secrets. 
What you hide in the private, it, 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 would be, it, it can destroy your life. In fact, the Bible says this, that the Bible says that there is an enemy of our soul. The Bible calls him the devil. And basically, the Bible also describes him as a lion who's, who's looking to see whom he may devour. And a lion will always catch prey that's living in isolation. So if there's things in your life that nobody knows about except you, it, 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 it's not a safe place to be. In fact, I want to say this, that if you're uncomfortable sharing your issues in a group, I get it. And doing life with people and trusting people, I get it. But can you do me a favor? Just find one person. Yeah. Just find one person that you, can, that you can get with and share with. Can I tell you, the, the reason that we, that we do groups is it, simple, really. It's honestly so that you can get to a place where you just remove the mask. Where, where, where eventually you can get so comfortable that you can say, hey, guys, this is really what I'm dealing with. My marriage is not okay. The addiction that it's, I'm, I'm still struggling with it. I, I have issues. Some of us, we, we need to remove the mask. Because if we're honest, it's robbed us of our freedom. It's robbed us from being able to move forward. You, you guys know, you know what I'm talking about. This is the area in your life that you pray about but never changes. And, and it's because nobody else knows about it. But if, if somebody else knew about it, I promise you, you'll get wind in your sails and that situation will turn around for you because now you'll have people doing life, doing life with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. I love, I love how the Apostle Paul says it. He says, we refuse, to, we refuse to wear masks and play games. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open. The whole truth is on display. The whole truth is on display. I'm not telling you to share your business with everybody, but I am saying find somebody that you trust. Because in that relationship, you would find healing. Well, Mike, hold on a second. What do you mean? Won't Jesus do this for me? Like, can't I just go to Jesus with my issues? Won't, you, won't, he, won't he just be the one to fix me? Can I tell you? No. I want to read to you a verse, James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Can I tell you something? You go to Jesus for forgiveness, but you go to people for healing. And some of us, this is, this is the mindset that we need to have. That the only way you're going to find healing in a certain area of your life is if you, if you go to people. Mike, how does this work? Simple, because now you have accountability. Now you have somebody in your life who can call you and be like, bro, I know what you do every time you go on that business trip. Don't do it again. Bro, bro, I, I, I know the relationship that you're having with your wife. It's, it's not good. Let's talk about it. Let's work it out. Hey, that addiction that you have, bro, I, I'm here with you. Hey, bro, don't watch that. It's, it's ruining your mind. It's changing the whole psychological aspect of how you live. Bro, don't do that anymore. And what we, need, we need these kind of people. We need people who, who, would get, who, would, who would get in our life. You know what this requires? It, requires? it requires you not having a spirit of offense. Because I think today we live in a generation who's very highly offended. And because you're so offended... Nobody can step into your life and tell you the truth. And it's not, and because of that, you're not living the life that God has designed for you to live. You, you have no idea how many people I know who go from church to church because they've been offended. Because nobody can speak into their life. Can I tell you that that's a dangerous place to be? And you have to start knocking down the walls of offense so the truth of God can enter your life. The Bible says that Jesus is grace and truth. You can't have truth without grace, and you cannot have grace without truth. You need both. It's the only way you'll be set free and live the life that you were designed to live. Can, can I take a moment? I want to talk to the CEOs, leaders, managers, bosses. If you have yes men on your team, it's a very dangerous place to be. 
If you got people in your life who would only say, bro, you're amazing. Bro, you're doing so good. Nothing you do is wrong. Let me tell you, that position that you're at right now, you're going to find yourself at a place where you're going to fall. Because you don't allow people in your life and in your company and your life to go up to you and say, hey, bro, look, I don't think that this is okay. Come on, we got to start knocking down the walls of offense. I, I think the reason that we need to do this, third point, is because we have blind spots. These are the parts that I don't know, but you know. These are the parts that, that I don't know that I have, but come on, everybody can see it. Like, wait, hold on a second, bro, I really act that way? Like, I'm really prideful? Bro, come, am I really that arrogant? Bro, am I really that mean? Yes. Everyone else can see it except you. I remember one time I was hosting a service. You know how, like, in the beginning of a service, Pastor JP did it earlier. And come on, hosting is a big moment. We want to get people excited. Come on, so good to see everybody here, believing that the best is yet to come, believing that God's going to do amazing things in your life. And I don't remember if it was my wife or Phil in the front row. And when I was hosting the moment, passionately putting my heart on the line, they started doing And I go, bro, what do you, what, what do you, and I look down, and my zipper was down. <laughs> so I turned around to the band, and whoop, and they, they became my connect group. And <laughs> they saw it, but you didn't see it. <laughs> and can I, I want to tell you this morning, listen, look at me. There's people in your life that need to know what's happening. My, my, listen. There are people in your life who need to know what's happening. You're not meant to do life alone. If it was, think about it. God just would have created an island with you on it. But that wasn't God's plan. It was for us to be in community. You see, I need someone who will be honest with me. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. It's crazy. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful is that person who tells you, hey, bro, stop acting that way. Faithful is the person who tells you, hey, that path that you're walking on, I'm not trying to judge you, bro. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just trying to help you. That path that you're walking on, it's not good for your life. That's faithful. Look at the rest of the verse, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. I love it. But an enemy will give you multiple kisses. <laughs> Be careful with those people who always tell you, hey, bro, nothing that you do is wrong. Like, bro, you're so good. Life is awesome. Keep living the life that you're living. God will forgive you. Live free. Live, all, live the way that you want to live. Life is, life is good. But we all need that person in our life who will, be, who will be honest with us. Why? Because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And if there's things in your life that you're unaware of and don't fix, it will be difficult for you to live the life that God has for you. So we need people in our life. This is my fourth point. The reason that you need people in your life is because you have potential. This is, this is the part that I don't know and the part that you don't know. So who knows? God. Well, Mike, what does that have to do with Connect Group? Well, the plan that God put in place, he devised a plan where you will find your giftings, that you would find your purpose doing it in community and doing it in life. It's God's plan for you to get in the group. Listen, you will never know your potential alone. I remember when I was, I was 16 years old. And uh, some of you know a, a bit of my story. When I was 16 years old, um, I, I grew up in a broken home, very broken. Uh, my mom was an immigrant. My dad was always in and out of prison because uh, he was a heavy drug user. He was very, very violent, very abusive. Um, he's been in prison my whole life. In fact, he's serving now. He's got like another six years left. And, but to the glory of God, my God's not the same person. God's doing something in his heart. He's changing. God's doing something amazing. <laughs> amazing. And... Uh, I remember, um, I remember I was about eight years old, and this is at the time that my, my dad just wasn't doing too good. He wasn't healthy, and uh, he, he was physically abusing my mom, like 
really bad. I remember, I remember sometimes seeing blood on the, on the tile of the floor. And um, I was eight, and I, I had this neighbor. She was amazing. And while my mom was up at night working a security job from like 8 p.m. to like 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, I, I, would, I would stay at my neighbor's house. I remember being eight years old, just laying in bed, just thinking, God, what's, what's the purpose of this? Like, I, I know that there has to be more than, than this. So when I got saved at 16, I was confused because I encountered God, but I had no idea that God had a purpose for my life. So I had this youth pastor. We had a youth group of 60 kids. It was like that for five years, but it was powerful. This youth pastor, every Friday night, he would take me out to dinner, and he would always tell me, Mike, I really believe that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And at first, I didn't believe it, but he said it so much that eventually I believed it. Can I tell you, you need a, you need a circle of people in your life who realize your potential. When I, was, when I was 20 years old, I came to this church. I was, I was 20 years old. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I would be doing what I'm doing today. N never. At least not here. I mean, this church has global influence. People know, I mean, come on, you're blessed to go to this church. People know who you are. This place is amazing what we're doing in our city. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I'd be doing ministry, especially in a place like this. But then I got into a connect group and people would say, Mike, you know, I really believe that, that you have a ministry calling in your life. And, and I don't know what that's going to look like for you, but I, I really believe that you have this calling over your life. Can, can I tell you, can I just be honest? Can I lay my heart out on the line? Sometimes I, I still don't think I have that calling. But I got leaders in my life. I got people who have come around in my life and say, hey, I, I see the potential in you. That's why they make me do stuff like this. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but listen, I'm not, thank you, but it's not, I'm not doing this for the applause. The reason that I'm sharing my story is because I want you to know, listen, that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And the only way you're going to find out what that is is when you get into a community. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, I'm going to close. I know some of us are hungry. <laughs> Proverbs 18, verse 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I love this. A, a man of many companions may come to a ruin. Really what this verse is saying is that there's people where you don't have a lot of friends, but you have a lot of acquaintances. And it's not doing you very well. Like you're here, you're around people, but people really don't, they really don't know you. And my biggest fear is that you're living a life where people really don't know who you are. It's one of my, it's one of my biggest fears for people because I know the blessing that comes with being in community. Can I tell you, the most important decisions that you'll ever make in your life will always be your relationship decisions. And the same thing remains true with your relationship with God. And going back to this verse, I think a lot of people, we treat God casually. We treat him like an acquaintance. We treat him like a companion. Like, God, God I, I, I know that uh, I go to church on Sundays. Like, I know about a God, but I really don't know him. Can I tell you, God wants more than that. God wants to have a relationship with you. Can I tell you, this whole religion, everything that we do, is not based on rules and regulations. It's not based on religion. It's only based on one name, and his name is Jesus, and it's based on having a relationship with that God. He, he wants, we have a God who wants friendship with you. In fact, listen, Jesus' name in the Bible was the friend of sinners, meaning that he wants to do life with you. He wants to, in fact, can I tell you, this idea is so important that this is the thing that will determine your eternity. Having a friendship, a relationship with God. Like a God that you, that you really, really know. Can I ask you this question to close? Do you have that relationship with God? 
Come on, can you stand up to your feet? We're going to pray in a moment. We're going to close. And I really feel like today, maybe you're in this place and maybe you don't have a relationship with God or maybe the relationship that you have with God has been casual. Can I tell you that right now at this moment, just with one decision, that can change. That right now at this moment, you can really step into a life-giving relationship with God. Creator of the universe, he wants to have a relationship with you. If you can, can you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I thank you so much for your grace, your love, and your mercy, and for everything that you're doing in this place. And Lord, I ask in this moment that you would begin to, that you would begin to move in the hearts of those who don't yet have a relationship with you. Maybe you're in this place and you're saying, Mike, you know what? I want to start a relationship with God. I no longer want it to be casual. I really want to know who he is. I want to take this relationship serious. If that's you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, if you say, Mike, I want to step into a relationship with God, what I'm going to ask you to do is just shoot your hand up in the air, every eye closed, every head bowed. This is a private moment. It's a holy moment. I really believe that the Spirit of God is moving in this place right now. So when I count to three, just shoot your hand up in the air just so I can see you and I know who I'm praying for. One, two, three. Three. God bless you. 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 God bless you back there. God bless you, man. God bless you, bro. Good move, man. Good move. God bless that couple in the back. Amazing. 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 Come on, you can put your hands down. Put your hands down. Amazing. Amazing. What we're gonna do in a moment? It's gonna be very simple. We're gonna. We're all gonna do a repeat after me prayer. Can I tell you, it's not really about the words, it's more about a heart, about, more about a heart posture. In fact, we're gonna do this together as a family. Can we all just lift up our hands? Just all lift up our hands as a sign of surrender. Repeat this prayer after me. Say, dear Jesus, I invite you inside to be my friend, to be my savior, to be my God. Forgive me of my sin and wash me clean. I believe in you and I trust you. And it's in Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. Come on, let's give a big round of applause to everybody who made that decision. Amazing.